هاني اليوم نحكي معاك باسمي واسم الشعب الكل اللي عايش في الاحلام 2011 ما زال فما شكون يموت بالجوع حب يخدم باش يعيش لكن هلو ايفريبودي اوكي ام Zuerst eine Frage an die Deutschsprecher und sonst gibt es, diese Veranstaltung wird auf Englisch stattfinden. Gibt es jemand hier, der Englisch nicht verstehen kann? Gut, now we'll go into it. Go, go into it. So, uh, welcome everyone to this meeting. This is the meet meeting for, organized by the Linker um, Berlin Internationals. Normally we meet in more intimate surroundings, but because of the interest in this meeting, we've moved into a big, uh, a big room. Um, more about that later. We have, as, well, I guess you know, you know who we have because that's why you're here. Uh, Hossam El Hamalawi is a Egyptian journalist and an activist. It's kind of a shame that he's here because he should be in Egypt where it's not safe, not safe for him at the moment. But he was one of the uh, leading activists within the uh, Tahrir Square occupations in 2011 and was the go-to person in terms of the uh, writing reports and analysis of what was happening. He's going to speak for about half an hour on um, what's left of the Arab, Arab Spring. There's then going to be plenty of time for anybody to ask questions or make your own contributions. We want to be out of here at nine, and then we'll go to a local uh, pub where we can carry on the discussion in more, uh, yeah, it's um, close, close circumstances. Um, oh yeah, my name, I'm Phil Bilton, I'm one of the speakers of the uh, Berlin Internationals. If you want to know more about what we do, um, you can leave us your mail address and join our mailing list. Okay. Uh, We'll start with we'll start with Hossam. Oh, people are coming in, um, but this meeting is being filmed. Uh, the, the cameras are pointing forward, so if you don't want to be filmed, that's no problem. But um, later, when people are, when later when people making contributions, let us know if you don't want to be caught on camera, and we'll, we'll organise that you're not, um, and we'll put the video online as soon as we can. Right, Hossam. Okay. Um, thanks a lot for. Um coming tonight. I'm really humbled uh, by this uh, great turnout. And I would like to thank Phil for uh, helping to organize uh, this meeting. And we'll be playing a slideshow um, as, uh, as we go on. Um, I don't know about you, but my uh, social media feeds uh, have been cluttered over the past couple of weeks with the 10 years challenge. And apart from the largely embarrassing photos of uh, family members and friends, um, my, I mean, I came also across photos like these. Uh, Phil, can you please? Um, which in part could sum up uh, what many in Egypt and outside feel uh, towards what's left uh, of the Arab Spring. Um, eight years after we had a fantastic, impressive revolution against Hosni Mubarak, the military dictator who ruled this country with an iron fist for 30 years, we ended up uh, with even a worse dictator, uh, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. Um, at the moment, uh, Egypt is, is literally an open-air prison. Uh, with uh, at least 60,000 political prisoners languishing in, in jails. Uh, 17 new prisons at least have been built since the coup. Uh, horrible massacres happened in the year of 2013 following the military coup. And as soon as Sisi became officially the president during his first term, the first four years, uh, we did a study, which you will find here in the infographs, um, that I've left um, around. Basically, the government, uh, the police, and the army are, are killing, on average, 2.2 Egyptian citizens per day. Uh, two Egyptian citizens are also dying per week in, one, in custody, whether it's in prisons or in the detention facilities. Uh, hundreds of activists have been slapped with travel bans, so they can't leave the country at the moment. Um, people are disappearing, and sometimes after they disappear, they show up, or their corpses photos show up on the Facebook page of our military spokesperson as people killed in clashes. Um, so overall, I mean, there is definitely a, a massive disappointment among uh, so many Egyptians. 
Uh, this is also another picture uh, that, came, that I came across in my feeds, but uh, these uh, were mainly circulated by uh, Syrian regime bots uh, that are trying to discredit or attack the Arab Spring. But in part, it can also sum up how a great part uh, uh, of the people, or a majority, not a majority, but like a good a number of people feel towards how the Arab Spring ended up in these countries. Uh, in Libya, which witnessed a genuine revolt against um, um, the dictator Muammar Gaddafi uh, in 2011, was followed by uh, NATO intervention and airstrikes. And um, eight years later, the country is in a very bad shape. It's not really in a good shape. Uh, Islamic um, uh, extremists, uh, some of them are affiliated with Al-Qaeda and others with ISIS, did control parts of the country for uh, long periods of time, uh, or were at least active and they had strong presence. Other parts of the country are controlled or dominated by tribal militias, and in the east and great chunks of the country is now controlled by Libya's strong man, uh, Field Marshal Haftar, who is backed by the UAE and backed by Egypt um, in his own war on terror and war on illegal uh, migration, or these twin quotes, of course. Um, and in leaked videos that surfaced online, you can see that the behavior of his troops are really no, um, no better than ISIS or no better than uh, um, Gaddafi, the former dictator, in terms of extrajudicial killings, executions, and what have you. Um, in Yemen, uh, Yemen is another tragic story where um, a genuine revolt broke out in the beginning of 2011 uh, against Ali Abdullah Saleh, the dictator of Yemen. Uh, he tried to crush the revolt um, with the help of Saudi Arabia in the beginning, but when the regime was on the verge of collapse, Saudi Arabia tried to provide a safe exit for Ali Abdullah Saleh in exchange for a transitional government that will basically continue the old regime's policies, but under different names. And this was all happening in the midst of an insurgency by the Shia rebels, the Houthis, who've managed to take over the capital. And this was the excuse uh, that Saudi Arabia and the UAE and the so-called alliance um, used in order to start bombing Yemen back to the Stone Age. And I think, I mean, you're all following the news about some of the worst humanitarian disasters now on the face of the planet uh, does exist in Yemen. And I will spare you the graphic photos of the dying Yemeni children. Um, in Syria, Syria is probably the most tragic, you know, I mean, story of the Arab Spring when, whenever we, we bring it up. Uh, what started as also a very genuine revolt against the Ba'ath regime and the dictator Bashar al-Assad in, in 2011 um, was met with live ammunition, was met with sheer brutality, was met with medieval style of torture in prisons, was met with aerial bombings, and increasingly the revolution was cornered and pushed towards militarization. And what went on in the following years, um, I mean, people can disagree whether it was like a civil war, a sectarian war, still that had elements also of rebellion and revolutionary elements against the regime. But today, in 2019, it, it cannot be, re be really looked at as a success story. Um, it's, it's among the most tragic uh, uh, ones. Um, this is the forgotten revolution that very few people, I mean, tend to bring out for a long list of reasons. This is Bahrain that also witnessed uh, a genuine uh, mass movement from below in 2011 against the uh, autocrat Hamad, uh, the ruling monarch. Uh, this movement included Sunni and Shiites, you know, I mean, together. Um, but this mass movement was met with sheer brutality, with love ammunition, and not only that, but Hamad invited the GCC countries, the Gulf countries, uh, and their troops, uh, their joint troops, to intervene in Bahrain and to help him quell uh, uh, the uprising. 
Uh, today, Bahrain is in a very bad shape in, term, in terms of revolutionary politics. Thousands are languishing in prisons. Uh, death sentences are being showered like, you know, like rain showers from the sky. Uh, activists are being stripped of their citizenship and they are expelled to Iraq. Um, it's, um, it's definitely um, also a very tragic uh, story. Um, the only country that people tend to present as a success model is Tunisia. Um, Tunisia, the cradle of the Arab Spring, that's where the Arab Spring started in December 2010. And it's usually cited as a success story because it didn't turn into a military conflict. It didn't witness the large-scale massacres that happened in the other countries that witnessed uprisings. And there are democratic elections. I mean, you can definitely, I mean, vote uh, uh, over there, unlike other countries where it is merely ceremonial or it doesn't even exist. And there were some significant reforms, at least in, in the area of, of women's rights uh, in Tunisia. But the, the real story might be a little bit different. Um, Tunisia, the political establishment, rests on a very uneasy alliance between members of the old regime and the Islamists over there who are reformists, uh, ex-Muslim Brotherhood, or they come from the same tendency. It's a very long story to, to go into the, these complicated details. Um, at least in the question of social justice, many Tunisians are disillusioned with soaring unemployment, with soaring uh, economic inequalities. And the same neoliberal policies that were uh, enacted under Ben Ali are actually continuing uh, under the sponsorship of the IMF and, and the World Bank. Um, so, so, I mean, with this, I mean, th this might look like a bleak picture, and I'm I'm not trying to um, I'm not trying to I mean treat it otherwise. It is a very difficult uh, situation. However, I'm still hopeful, and my hopes are not based on wishful thinking or some uh, revolutionary fantasies that I have in my head but it's based on the laws of history and it's based on the laws of revolutions. And the law number one is that revolution is not just a moment. This is a graffiti from downtown Cairo in 2011 that expresses this point. Um, revolutions usually take everyone by surprise. Um, you have the most famous example, historical example, of Lenin in January 1917 addressing his party members, saying that it's not my, it's not my generation that's going to witness the revolution, it's yours. One month later, you know, the Russian Revolution breaks out. On the morning of the 25th of January 2011, none of the main organizers in the Egyptian Revolution, I mean, believe that you know it, it's revolution day i mean or it's starting today actually whenever anyone on that day would approach me and tell and and tell me that you know are we starting a revolution today i would say like you know chill out no revolutions break out by facebook events um and our ceiling of demands on on the beginning of the revolution at least was just the impeachment of the interior minister and holding you know police officers accountable for the torture that was happening. But the chant, you know, the people want the downfall of the regime came, came later. It did, it did not start uh, uh, like that. Um, revolutions do not happen out of the blue. And if a revolution uh, breaks out somewhere, this means that there was a, already a process with years and sometimes decades preceding it. Um, and the revolutions in that case are basically the climax. Can we please? Uh, Egypt in the 1990s, I will take the example of Egypt, you know, I mean quickly. Egypt in the 1990s, basically Mubarak had managed to crush all, so, all forms of dissent uh, under the guise of the war on terror. 
uh, no street protests were happening. As student activists, we couldn't even mention Mubarak's name. Uh, you can at best talk about the government. Mubarak was a huge taboo. Once you left your university campus, you, you were risking live ammunition being shot at you. No labor strikes was happening. But the turning point uh, came in the year 2000 with the outbreak of the Palestinian Intifada. And the Palestinian Intifada suddenly uh, started this process of street politics revival. For the first time in probably two decades, Egyptians in the thousands were taken to the streets in solidarity with the Palestinians. This was followed by the war on Iraq, which revived street politics even more. So this is happening in the year 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003. Um, all of these mobilizations evolved into the anti-Mubarak movement, Kifaya, which is Arabic for enough, in the year 2004, 2005, 2006. And although Kifaya was largely confined as a middle class uh, movement, but Airing those visuals of the protests to the rest of the population, whether it's via satellite channels or the rising independent media in Egypt, indirectly made the militancy spill over to the rest of the population. So that's when we started uh, uh, the winter of labor discontent in December 2006 by the famous strike in Ghazd al-Mahalla, which is the largest uh, textile mill in the Middle East. Um, the winter of labor discontent continued. Strikes were happening in all sectors, not just the textile sector. And that's in 2006, 2007. By 2008, we already had too many uprisings in Egypt. One was in April 2008 in Mahalla. That's where, from where the picture is. And the other one was, did not receive as much coverage, but it was no less important. It was in the city of Al-Borollos, uh, north of Egypt. Um, and these, this accumulation of, militants, of militancy and dissent kept on piling up until the explosion happened in 2011 in Egypt with the Egyptian revolution. Uh, this is a photo I took in my neighborhood uh, on the morning of the January 29th in front of the police station after the police opened fire on, on, uh, on our march. Um, what I'm trying to say, uh, no, just once, yeah. Uh, what I'm trying to say here is that in Egypt, in Yemen, in Syria, in Libya, in Tunisia, in all of these countries that witnessed uprisings, these did not happen out of the blue, you know, I mean, suddenly. Each country of those had its own process for years. Maybe foreign journalists who were based in these countries did not notice it and they did not tell you about it because they are usually obsessed with news about terrorism or news about archaeological, you know, I mean, findings. Maybe political activists themselves who were present in these countries could not see things that were fermenting uh, beneath uh, the surface. But any country that witnessed an uprising was going through its own uh, uh, process. Um, and yes, the revolutions in these countries, I would say, have been defeated. I mean, I'm not going to, you know, some people try to find like other expressions to go around it. But I would say that at least this wave of revolutions uh, that happened in Yemen, in Syria, in Bahrain, in Egypt, and Libya got defeated. And in the case of Tunisia, I would say it got co-opted or diffused, more or less. Um, but the same reasons that pushed those countries into a revolution, they still exist. I mean, these revolutions did not just break out because of some conspiracy in the air. I mean, these revolutions were triggered by the question of social justice. These revolutions were triggered by the question of police brutality and by political repression. Uh, each country definitely has its own conditions and has its own specific concrete demands, but these were the common denominator that instigated uh, this wave of the Arab Spring. Some activists don't like to use the, the term Arab Spring because they feel it, it gives the impression that, oh, something happened in Tunisia, and 
the following day, all the Arabs were just copycatting it out of context, which is not true. Each country went through uh, its own development. Now, if the reasons that pushed those countries into a revolt are still there, and the counter-revolutionary regimes that came uh, to crush those revolutions and reached power are not addressing uh, those problems. Actually, they are aggravating it more and more. This means that there could be a potential in the future for a revolutionary revival. But I am sorry to say this is not going to happen anytime soon. Uh, this revolutionary recovery in, in countries like Egypt or Yemen or elsewhere, it's not going to happen anytime soon. Number one, because the peoples in, in these countries have paid a very heavy price. Uh, there is a huge death toll. Thousands have been killed. Thousands have been imprisoned. Thousands have been tortured. The economy is in shambles. Um, the revolutionary organizations and the independent unions that, that spearheaded those revolts have been largely uh, uh, crushed. And it, it will take uh, a long time in order to rebuild those structures again. But there is another factor, not just the repression. This factor is hope and confidence. The people in those countries that witnessed the counter-revolutions and, and this wave of repression, they have to have some level of confidence that if they try again, it will work this time. And this will take some time you know, for this confidence to be regained, but not just time. They need to see a successful model somewhere close to them. And that's where other countries in the region uh, come into the picture. Each Arab country that did not witness an uprising, a proper uprising, you know, like what happened in Egypt or elsewhere, is and has been also going through its own development or has, has been going through its own process. Now, this process is not like, you know, I mean, some ABCD manual. Uh, it's not the same manual for every country. Um, in some cases, countries are faster than the other in terms of political development for a long list of reasons. Um, but at the same time, each country is going and has been going through its own political process of development, of revolutionary development, and it hasn't yet reached that stage of uprising. And this could happen in the future. And this is not some utopian or wishful thinking. Since 2014, but by mid-2014, I have to say, like, I, I myself, I fell into depression. I was like, game over for us in Egypt for now. Um, I, even after the coup, by the end of, or by July 2013, I still had hope that at least we can resist, you know, I mean, the, uh, the return of the military. And still, there could be hope for us to mobilize uh, against it. By, by mid-2014, I had honestly lost hope. Um, and at the time, I kept three countries on my watch list, basically, because these were the ones where I was placing uh, my hopes. Uh, Sudan, surprisingly for some, might be Jordan, and Morocco. This doesn't mean that there is something really unique about those three countries, and I might turn out to be wrong, but at the same time, according to the situation that I've been monitoring across the region, these were the three countries that had potential still to carry out or to witness uh, a, a revolution. And indeed, I don't know if you're uh, following the news at the moment, Sudan is finally going through its own revolution. This doesn't mean that it also happened out of the blue. Uh, so that the Sudanese, by the way, they have a long, and, and they are proud of it, they have a long tradition of uh, resistance against military dictatorships. They had a very famous revolution in 1964 against the first military uh, dictatorship they had following independence. They had another revolution in 1985. And after the outbreak of the Arab Spring, they did, Sudan did witness protests in 2011 and in 2012. But the, a stronger wave of protests started in September 2013, which was, uh, 
I mean, I would say it's like a mini uprising. It was very close to a revolutionary situation. And since last December, the Sudanese have been going through a new wave, a new revolutionary wave. Uh, at the moment, uh, Omar al-Bashir is, uh, I mean, yesterday he was in Egypt uh, in talks with the Sisi. Uh, before that, he was in Qatar trying to get some money. And, you know, all the Arab countries, even those who don't like one another and they are in fights, like, you know, the UAE, Qatar, all of them are like, you know, I mean, saying we are for the stability of Sudan. We do support uh, Omar al-Bashir because no one wants another revolution uh, from those guys. Um, and... Imagine this, if, if the Sudanese managed to topple uh, Omar al-Bashir, which I think it's highly likely to happen, that could be the start of shifting the balance a little bit to the side of revolution in the region, away from the counter-revolution. I can see already, uh, I mean, in my social media feeds, all Egyptians, or like a big number of Egyptians, they are all following what's happening in Sudan, drawing parallels, and saying, well, you know, this reminds us of something that happened in this country a few years ago, and hopes are running high, um, I have to say. Not that I'm trying to imply that if the revolution succeeds in Sudan, the following day something is going to happen in Egypt. As I told you, it, the, the process of recovery is going to take uh, uh, some time. It's not going to happen in, anytime soon. But the success of revolutions in the region might speed up this recovery. The second country uh, is, is Jordan. And um, this came as a, I mean, it was a little bit of a surprise to me, um, I mean, a few years ago, because for long list of reasons, I've been dismissive of Jordan in terms of a potential for any revolutionary change. Um, for, for a long list of reasons, which, I mean, are honestly irrelevant now, because obviously I was wrong. Um, Jordan did have, uh, protests, did witness protests uh, in 2011 and 2012. Some of them were really strong. Uh, but then last summer, in June, mass mobilization in the capital and in the provinces started over the taxation law. This was the spark. But then during the, that movement, many other demands were put up. I mean, about uh, a true constitutional monarchy, about uh, political reforms in the country, about the situation of political detainees, and whether that, you know, it's, uh, we're not just content with the king coming up every now and then to give amnesty to political detainees, let's have the rule of law. And I saw videos with my own, you know, I mean eyes, and I could hear chants against the king, uh, which is not the first time to happen in Jordan, but it's very rare that, you know, the ceiling would be as high as chanting for the downfall of uh, Abdullah. Now, the king moved quickly. He also, I mean, met with Sisi, met with the GCC, you know, I mean, countries, tried to get more money in order to inject in the economy and diffuse the situation a little bit. He impeached the government, uh, uh, brought in a new government, but that new government isn't really doing much uh, change from its predecessor. So a renewed wave started in December that was met with real sheer brutality, and although things have calmed down a little bit, but I would urge you to keep an eye on Jordan. Um, the third country is Morocco. Um, Morocco did witness also, I mean, it has been also going through its own process over the past years uh, prior to 2011. It did witness um, uh, protests in 2011, 2012, which were then uh, diffused or quelled using a mixture of both like repression and promises of reform, uh, only to be renewed, you know, I mean, later in 2017, uh, I don't know how many of you have been following Harak al-Reef uh, in Morocco, where thousands were on, thousands and thousands on the streets. I mean, this is just like, you know, I mean, uh, one picture of it. But if you go on YouTube, I mean, you, you will find tons of videos. Um, this movement, I mean, they did put forward many demands, I mean, related to austerity, related to marginalization, uh, related to the lack of social services. 
related to uh, things related to the identity of the Amazigh uh, also, I mean, Morocco. Um, and although it has been quelled uh, uh, with severe dose of uh, repression, and it did not get the enough coverage it deserves in the Arab world because basically since, I mean, Morocco was in good terms with Qatar, so, I mean, Al Jazeera did not cover, uh, I mean, the protests or was very conservative in, in its uh, coverage. Um, and the last point, and I will stop here, is, I mean, Palestine. Um, for over half a century, the Palestinian cause has been one of the major uh, politicizing and radicalizing factors uh, for the Arab people uh, in the region. I mean, I personally got into politics um, as a young kid, you know, via uh, the Palestinian Solidarity Movement. Uh, they continue to act as a source of inspiration in the same way that there is an umbilical cord between 2011 and the year 2000 that witnessed the outbreak of the Second Palestinian Intifada there is also an umbilical cord between the 1977 revolution in Egypt and also the Palestinian cause. If you, I mean, this is not discussed much, but 1977, our bread uprising in January uh, 1977 was the climax of a political revolutionary process that was started by supporters of the Palestinian Revolution Society in on university campuses in the beginning of the 1970s. That's, in the end, that's what culminated in 1977. And by the way, at the time, 1977 in Egypt, 1978, the Tunisians had a workers' uprising led by the unions. 19, uh, um, uh, 1997, uh, that's, sorry, 19, 79, sorry, 1979, uh, that's when the Iranian Revolution uh, also happened. And the whole region was in turmoil at the time. This is another Arab Spring that you don't hear much about. When revolutions happen in anywhere, they do spread by the domino effect. And the defeats, they also spread by the domino effects. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll just stop here to take your question and feedback, and then we'll come back uh, later. Thank you. So, uh, thanks, Osab. We've got well over an hour for people to ask questions or to make their own contributions. Um, a couple of years. Um, Hossam's talked about Sudan. Sudanese activists in Berlin are organizing a demonstration this weekend. I'm still waiting for the exact details, but we'll post the information to our mailing list and, fa and, and Facebook page. If you want to know more about this and other meetings which you organize, there'll be lists going around where you can sign up for the mailing list. Now, if you want to speak, put your hand up. Unfortunately, the microphone in the middle isn't working, so you're going to have to use these microphones in the front, which means if you don't want to appear on the film, wave and we'll not film you. Try and not speak for more than about three minutes. Um, you can ask questions, you can talk about your own experiences. Um, as many people who want to speak should speak. If you want to say something, just put your hand up and come to the front. Um, so thank you so much, Hassan, for coming. That was a really excellent talk and a great excuse to read more about the Egyptian Revolution because I didn't really know that much, so I'm still kind of getting my head around it a little bit. Um, you talked about a lot of you know, really um, important stuff, like the revolutions and how they spread and stuff, and I think that's really... Um, important because the you know the morale of a uh, movement is you know so critical it's the same for us here you know I, i'm actually from australia um but you know you hear about whenever there's you know big movements going on like f you know i'm part of the you know more of the western world so we hear more about that you know um but what's going on in france you know is so important and that's really really inspiring and it gives you kind of hope that there are things we can do um i have a question as well just on the side of that I don't know if it's relevant or not to what I just said, but um, I would be really interested to hear about the um, socialist organization. I know you're a revolutionary socialist, and you didn't really talk about the um, the socialist groups in particular. I'm in particular interested in Egypt. Um, so if you could talk more about that, I'd, that'd be amazing. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I grew up in Ras al Khaimah in the United Arab Emirates, 
And um, I was, as a kid and growing up and being a teenager, I also went to university there. Um, we were always aware of things happening outside of the UAE, but we never talked about them or were able to process them out loud. Um, and it was a very like, kind of double life that we were living. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk more about the UAE potential for revolution at all there, um, your view of the UAE. Yeah. Uh, so I'm also from Egypt, and uh, you mentioned something very interesting to me, that you still have hope, which I think is very courageous and audacious at the same time to have it at this point. So you mentioned that how we are kind of really moving even to a worse kind of regime. So being a journalist and being an activist, I have like two questions. So how, what is the role of journalists and activists at this point, or at this point of you know, the recovery phase, as you mentioned? And how do you think that they can function within such a repressive you know, a system right now where everything or basically any chance of free speech is more or less destroyed and almost all channels of uh, communications, even now, even social media, are being massively censored. So yeah, that's my question. Um, hi, Hossein. Uh, my name is Safa. I'm also from Egypt. Uh, can everybody hear me? Um, well, first of all, I'm ex-UN, so I don't like to, uh, to get <laughs> exposed. Um, now, my question is, you also mentioned about Harak al-Rif, which is rural um, movement in, in uh, uh, Morocco. Um, I just want you to highlight a bit more about the relationship between urban and rural movements, uh, if that's possible. I'm a researcher, and I'm also doing my PhD currently on activism, but particularly I'm looking at urban activism, so that's why I'm, I'm concerned about this. And the second question is related to uh, social classes. So I'm actually interested about um, hearing more about like the different, you know, role of classes, especially in Egypt. Thank you very much. So um, I'm also half Tunisian, and um, I don't really think that we have to, or we have to stop to name the revolution or Arab Spring because it is not no any more revolution. This revolution, the Arab countries were stolen by the regimes. And uh, if you compare that to the revolution in the South America, it's big, big um, gap. So I, we have to stop to name that revolution and also Arab Spring because it's not only more spring after all these people killed. Uh, about Tunisia, okay, there is a success, a little success in comparison to other Arab countries, but still uh, is all manipulated. We have um, votes, elections, but if these are transparent and uh, fair, I don't think so, because everything is manipulated by the big um, parties, the Islamists and uh, from the ex-regime. So um, we have hope in democracy in Tunisia, but uh, what is democracy? So yeah, thanks. Hi, thanks for the talk. I'm Dina from Egypt, and I think as most Egyptians in the room, these days are pretty tough for all of us. Um, so thanks for the reality check. I have two questions. The first is, what mistakes were made in Egypt, particularly in January 25th and the 11 days that followed, and the two years that followed? And how can we avoid that in the second wave that will eventually happen, according to you? Especially, which relates to my second question, <laughs> yeah, I know. Right now in Egypt, as you said, the state of affairs is only deteriorating to the worst. Um, and most Egyptians who are pro-revolution are either getting imprisoned, disappearing, or leaving Egypt. So what is left? What is le How can, yeah, where do we go from there? Thanks. Two, two quick questions. Um, uh, the numbers, uh, there was this CC interview uh, with CBS, um, which sort of uh, spurred the, the, the popular vote, I guess, in the Congress to stash the, US, uh, the Egyptian uh, USA to Egypt, or part of the USA to Egypt. And uh, how do you think that will affect the, the, po the, CC, the military regime's policy in Egypt in regards to uh, attacks on journalists like yourself and freedom of speech and uh, uh, rights groups and uh, all the uh, others. 
And the second question is, uh, how do you think we can um, shed more light on the censorships in Egypt? Because uh, the, the regime realized a very key element of the revolution that um, helped the revolution quickly develop was the use of social media, which was a revolutionary idea in its own. Twitter and Facebook were, were very big tools used, and that's why the government uh, shut down the, the, all the uh, internet and, the, and the, even the mobile lines and landlines because of that during the revolution. And uh, how do you think we can now combat the counter attack on free internet, free media, uh, with the government doing things like they, they're purchasing uh, huge software. I know for a fact I'm an engineer. They use stuff like Blue Coat. They're paying hundreds of thousands, if not millions, uh, to Canadian and uh, American uh, businesses that sell them the software. Italians. Yes, and the Italians as well recently. Very, very correct. And, um, and how, we pre how can we educate more activists in Egypt or even people who just casually read the, the, the so-called revolutionary news like Madame Masr or, or so um, to protect themselves with uh, technologies like Tor or, or um, VPN, etc. Thank you. Um, with the, let me first uh, get to the UAE um, uh, question. Uh, the UAE at the moment, together with Saudi Arabia, they are like the head of the snake. You know, I mean, they are like, you know, the sponsors of the counter revolutions in the Arab world. They tried to, uh, I mean, they did sponsor definitely, I mean, the coup in Egypt. They tried to instigate one in uh, Tunisia, which, you know, thank God, you know, I mean, they failed. Uh, but I mean, they, their fingerprints are all over, I mean, uh, counter revolutionary actions uh, uh, in the region. And, you know, I mean, back in the day, we used to say that, you know, um, any revolution in Egypt or in the region will have to confront um, the imperialist attacks on the U.S. Or, but actually, I mean, the closer enemy to us is Saudi Arabia and the UAE, you know, I mean, at the moment. And they are the ones who are doing this dirty work uh, on the ground. But this means that any sort of attempt at reforms or revolutions in this country, we have to stand by it. Because that's also, I mean, it will provide us with hope that if we do something in Egypt, they, they're not going to meddle in our affairs. Um, with the rise of the blogosphere in Egypt, you know, I mean, the, what they called the blogs revolution back in 2006 and 2007, and the rise of independent media, at the time, we were in contact with some UAE bloggers, and um, I, but most of them were like the liberalish kind of uh, guys who, who wanted, yes, I mean, democracy, who wanted some reforms, but I, we didn't really come across, um, you know, I mean, people with radical uh, politics, I mean, or our sort of politics, at least, you know, I mean, you guys, you know, I mean, here in the room. Um, I think there were few attempts uh, at organizing uh, protests in the UAE in 2011. Um, and at the time, uh, they even called it the Blackberry protests because, you know, it was organized largely via Blackberry. But uh, this is, I mean, this is, has been like, I mean, quelled uh, completely. Um, you know, ironically, Facebook, Twitter, and all the other social media uh, companies, they have the regional uh, offices are in Dubai and in the UAE. But these are some of the worst countries in terms of uh, electronic surveillance and in terms of uh, civil liberties uh, in general. They like to portray, you know, I mean, the idea that, you know, I mean, Dubai, come, you know, we have, you can wear a bikini, you know, I mean, on the beach, this, like, you know, I mean, still the Arab world, but we're all free. You can, you know, have your drink and blah, blah, blah. But in, in fact, it is a draconian uh, dictatorship run by some genocid genocidal, you know, I mean, maniacs, including a sheikh who even kidnapped his own daughter, you know, uh, the sheikh of Dubai. His daughter tried to flee even the country. He kidnapped her. You know, this is, this is kind of like medieval kind of like uh, politics. I, maybe there is some political process that's also, I mean, happening beneath the surface that I am not familiar with. But at this point, I don't really see much hope coming from the Emirati ranks in terms of dissent. And if there is any dissent that's going to happen, and it has already, you know, I mean, happened, it's going to be from the foreign uh, laborers, 
uh, over there who are working in slave-like uh, conditions, and they did organize series of strikes uh, before. Um, the situation might be different in Kuwait. The situation might be different in Oman. Um, the situation might be different in the eastern parts of Saudi Arabia, for example, where there are networks, actually, I mean, of activists uh, happening. But I'm, I'm not familiar with that similar kind of like networks in the UAE. Um, it might be my ignorance, might be that they don't, you know, I mean, exist uh, at the moment. Um, socialist politics in Egypt, it's a very, I mean, long story and maybe, um, I mean, I will talk a little bit about it now, but when I go home, I will also try to find some resources in English that I can put on the Facebook event page so that you guys can also, I mean, uh, check out. Um, in Egypt, the left had been completely crushed uh, following the 1977 uprising uh, that we had. Um, I mean, officially, it was dead with the collapse of the Soviet Union in uh, 1991, but effectively, it was crushed following the, the failure of the uprising. Uh, a slow revival in leftist politics uh, started uh, in the late 1990s, and I mean, I was part of the generation that joined the left in the second half of the mid 1990s that started rebuilding the leftist cells on university campuses uh, at the time. Um, it, I, I was in the year 2000, this was my first detention. I was detained three times under Mubarak. Uh, but the worst, I mean, the worst was definitely my, uh, my first experience. Um, the socialist movement did manage to grow um, because of our strong intervention in the Palestine Solidarity Movement and in the anti-war movement, and later with Kifaya, and we were among the first uh, political forces to manage to connect to the working class in, its, um, in the winter of labor discontent and what followed. This is prior to the revolution. But at the same time, we were not strong enough to provide leadership for the Egyptian revolution. I mean, I, I will not lie to you, I mean, I mean, about this. We might have been like, you know, I mean, the biggest in the radical left in Egypt, and I'm very proud of all the achievements that we've done, but we were not big enough to provide leadership for the Egyptian people who are like 100 million uh, at the end of the day. Uh, we entered the revolution and we, I mean, our circle of supporters was a few thousands. Um, we grew um, exponentially, of course, during the first uh, three years of the revolution. But at the moment, the situation doesn't look really, uh, I mean, that great. Um, our size and our uh, influence on the ground has shrunk uh, uh, tremendously. I mean, you used to um, operate basically in all the Egyptian, you know, I mean, provinces. Now you are operating in a handful of provinces. And it's not just because of political repression. It also has to do with demoralization. Like let's say if you had like committees in Governorate X, and these committees used to meet like, you know, on a weekly basis to discuss, you know, I mean campaigns and, you know, things to organize on the ground. Now the revolution has been defeated. Uh, there is nothing really that you can do much in terms of street politics. So via demoralization, you start basically disintegrating. And this is what happened uh, uh, to many of the Egyptian revolutionary organizations. We're not the only ones in the left, uh, of course. Uh, there are other comrades whom I hold in so much esteem and respect that exist in other uh, leftist organizations. But their situation is no better than ours uh, uh, at the moment. So we still exist. We do have some presence on the ground, like, you know, in, in few places which I, I don't want to name for security reasons at the moment. But again, we're, we're definitely not in our uh, best of shape. Um, the, the role of Egyptian activists and journalists. Uh, I mean, this I cannot give like a general advice, you know, I mean, about this. I believe that in such very delicate times, like each one got to find his or her own way to contribute if they were in Egypt. I mean, this is, 
it is a very, very risky situation. This is, this is like, we're having a dirty war, guys. Dirty war, Latin American style where basically everyone is disappearing, everyone is being, could be a target, you know I mean, the following day. It's not just, you know I mean, uh, those Islamists, you know I mean, radicals that, you know I mean, that they tell you about. Everyone is a target uh, at this point. But I believe that at least if you have a space, then my motto, I mean, throughout my career has been the spread of information is essentially an act of agitation. Um, in, there are people, I mean, definitely in places in Egypt who do want to revolt, but they think it's a completely crazy idea at this point to do it because no one is going to join us. No one is going to uh, uh, give their solidarity uh, uh, to us. But once you start spreading information of related to dissent, and this was our deliberate strategy, by the way, since 2006, uh, as, as socialists. I mean, you, you shower, you know, I mean, news of dissent basically to the working class and to our uh, networks everywhere to tell them it's not crazy to revolt. I mean, people are already doing it. And here are the visuals. Ghazda al-Mahalla went on strike yesterday, 13,000 workers, and they managed to win. You over there in Kafr al-Sheikh, you can do it if you just, you know, I mean, do like Ghazda al-Mahalla. So at least at this point, there are small minor battles of resistance that are happening here and there, whether it's over ho house demolitions, whether it's over sacking of workers, you know, I mean, from factories. And as a journalist, if you want to, like, put forward the cause of the, the revolution, at least these minor battles, try to highlight them in whatever uh, um, uh, way possible, putting your safety, you know, at this point as, as a priority. If you are abroad and you're not coming back, and you're not going back to Egypt anytime soon, then do whatever you want to do. Like meaning that, you know, I mean, you protest in front of the embassy, uh, you try to spread the message about uh, the abuses in Egypt, uh, elsewhere. Uh, you try to pressure the governments, basically, that are supplying CC with arms, like, I mean, France, Germany, and, and others, into cutting those uh, arms supplies. Um, many European countries are still dealing with CC uh, and having security cooperation agreements. Well, such security cooperation are basically with the Gestapo in Egypt. This is like, this is no different from, you know, I mean, the Nazi police or the intelligence services that you had here in Germany under Hitler. Whatever information that, that do trickle to Germany, if, if they ever, you know, I mean, come, they are extracted out of torture, uh, basically. So you try to stop uh, uh, these things. Um, I understand uh, your disappointment in Tunisia with how things, you know, I mean, went. But I would still argue that it was still a revolution. And even if it didn't achieve uh, its goals, whether in, in Tunisia or in Egypt or in elsewhere, these were revolutions that were defeated or, and, or were co-opted. But the fact that are they revolutions or not, they were uh, revolutions, but they were not uh, successful. And I think that we, we owe ourselves, you know, I mean, saying that because there were sacrifices and there was potential that was available for us at some point to do something really wonderful in this region that, has hap that hasn't happened in decades, if not centuries, uh, which is to live freely uh, at last. Um, and I don't think it's the end of the story, uh, as I was uh, trying to explain. And who knows, maybe we'll see something in Tunisia uh, uh, in the future. Um, mistakes in Egypt. Uh, this is a very long, you know, I mean, topic to talk about what mistakes we really fell in, you know, I mean, in Egypt. Um, but the main one is you cannot really compromise and you cannot really try to flirt with the old regime. It will eat you in the end. Apart from a tiny minority of radicals, including myself and, you know, I mean, and the radical leftists, from the night of January 28th, you know, I mean, it's actually our, it's, it's the anniversary, you know, I mean, today. The January 28th, 2011, that's when the Egyptians managed to beat uh, and break the, the police force in Egypt. 
uh, which was Mubarak's arm when it comes to controlling the daily lives of Egyptians. Uh, 222 police stations at least were burned across uh, the country. So this, I mean, goes back to the whole idea of marketing the Egyptian revolution as like, you know, I mean, the peaceful, I mean, it wasn't really, you know, I mean, that much. I mean, 222 police stations were burned. Um, you can even see videos that are still online of, you know, police stations in Northern Sinai being blown up by RPGs. In Suez, you know, the revolutionaries stormed police stations, they got the Kalashnikovs and they were shooting at the police. You know, the, the police had ended on that day and the regime was like up in the air. But from that night, all the political forces were trying to negotiate a deal with the old regime, accept us, and we will try to defuse, you know, I mean, the situation. Uh, naturally, the army, which is the representative of the regime, went for the Islamists in the beginning because they were the most well organized. Um, thinking that an alliance with the Islamists is gonna defuse the situation in the streets, and they were wrong, they were very wrong. But on the other hand, the liberals and sections also of the Egyptian left, they did the same game, you know, and they approached the military in 2013, and they were basically, I mean, involved in the coup, which is, I mean, a disgrace. And it is a curse that will, you know, I mean, haunt them forever, uh, to be honest. Um, so one of the biggest mistakes is basically trusting the army or trusting the old regime institutions that somehow if you just change the top, you know, you can use it for the benefit of the people or the benefit of your own political uh, uh, force. The other mistake is turning your back on the working class. I mean, the Egyptian revolution was marketed internationally as the Tahrir Square, you know, I mean, occupation. And while the Tahrir Square occupation was fantastic, it was impressive, it was a heroic battle, and I'm, I'm very proud, you know, I mean, to have been part of it, but what toppled Mubarak wasn't really Tahrir Square. What toppled Mubarak was on the 5th of February, when the regime tried to normalize the situation by reopening the institutions and the banks and the factories that the regime had shut down in the previous week since the start of the protests in an attempt to terrorize the public. Like, you know, there are no food, no supermarkets open, no government facilities are open, nothing is open. So, you know, to, to get us in this paranoia and insecurity. So when they reopened those facilities and factories on the 5th of February, thinking that this uh, will isolate the Tahrir revolutionaries so that the rest of the country would be behaving normally and you know the crazy guys in Tahrir are there. Actually, this was the biggest mistake. Tahrir you know, moved to the factories. So I mean, a huge wave of mass strikes started. Workers in the factories and in the government uh, civil service and the government uh, facilities were chanting the same chants as we had in Tahrir even if they didn't um, like declare their support for the revolution. It was there indirectly. And it's those mass strikes that happened from the 5th of February till the 10th, it's what pushed the army in the end to impeach Mubarak or else the whole uh, system was gonna fall. And as soon as Mubarak was overthrown, the first thing that the military did was to legislate against strikes and this was cheered by the Muslim Brotherhood, and this was cheered also by the liberals. Even one of the main, uh, I mean, liberal like figureheads um, uh, pre like came up with an initiative to send in the Tahrir revolutionaries to the factories to talk to the workers, you know, to suspend your strikes and let's focus on the constitution, let's focus on building the country. You know, you're like destroying the country again, blah 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 blah. Actually, no. I mean, what what broke Mubarak were the labor strikes. What actually pushed the military into handing over power in the beginning of 2012 to, uh, to civilians were the mass labor strikes that were happening in October, in November, together with an uprisings, mini uprisings that we had in November also and December. And general strikes are the biggest weapon that you can bring down any dictator uh, with. Um, and that's what I always talk with my Sudanese comrades, you know what I mean, about. Um, you can have your occupations in the squares, the regime will survive that. Marches, the regime can survive that. But once you start getting a general strike, that's when, you know, I mean, it's game over. 
Uh, and at least some good news from Sudan. I mean, from yesterday or early morning uh, today, uh, the workers in uh, the port workers in Port Sudan have gone on strike. And you know the videos and the pictures are, are all over Twitter. You can I mean check it out for yourselves. So this could be the beginning of the intervention of an organized uh, uh, working class. Um, two more things: um, the U.S. pressures on CC. I'm not really counting much on the U.S. pressures on CC, to be honest. I, I mean, like Trump asking CC to democratize is like a very funny idea. But even if it was Obama, I would still have felt the same. Um, definitely, the U.S. could pressure Egypt into releasing some of the dual nationals, you know, who are like Egyptian-American prisoners, and this has happened. And, you know, it's good. I mean, anyone who can, you know, I mean, leave prison in Egypt is definitely a, a plus at this point. Uh, there were some talk, and it happened before, that there were some stalling and some cutting in the military assistance and the aid. And although democracy was cited uh, in these moves, it turned out it's actually because the Egyptians were buying uh, missiles from North Korea. So, you know, I mean, obviously the Americans were pissed off about it. So they it introduced these um, um, sanctions at some point, but now it's lifted. Uh, while I do not expect anything positive coming out of the US government, um, I am actually putting and placing a lot of hope in the US um, activist community and civil society. Uh, these are our allies, and they have always been on our side, whether it's uh, uh, trade unions, whether it's left-wing activists, whether it's community activists. I mean, we can find definitely a common ground uh, between us and them, but not with the, uh, with the US government. Um, censorship and, and attacks on social media, which you raised, is, of course, uh, a very important uh, uh, point now. It's only, I mean, the Egyptian Mukhabara, the Egyptian intelligence services, literally now owns the entire media of Egypt. Literally. I mean, they have set up front companies, and they control, I mean, all the newspapers, and they control all, um, uh, you know, the TV channels that we have. And if you, like, if you know Arabic, and you watch, like, five minutes of Egyptian TV, I mean, Goebbels would have been proud, really. I mean, if you, like, watch, it, it's, it's horrible. It's, it's ap like, even... Americans who are like masters of propaganda, they, they put it in a much more subtle way than, than the Egyptians. Um, so, of course, they are obsessed with controlling the internet. Uh, and Sisi himself did say on occasions publicly, he always like, you know, I mean, goes on these Freudian slips. And he, he, he was like saying something along like, oh, I have two brigades. If I want, I can shut down the whole internet and control. He was referring to his bot's army. I mean, he does have... I mean, I mean, bots army on Twitter that are like, you know, taunting us and attacking us all the time. But, and at the moment, we have more than 500 uh, websites that are censored in Egypt. These websites vary from the sites of international human rights organizations like uh, Amnesty International, like Human Rights Watch, uh, to, you know, local uh, news organizations like Mada Masr, for example. And, uh, and all the human rights uh, organizations in Egypt. Uh, the site of the Revolutionary Socialists is also, I mean, ce uh, censored. But, I mean, of course it's negatively affecting us, but it did raise awareness about Tor and about VPNs and about uh, cybersecurity. Unfortunately, I don't know it off my head, but Tor did release uh, recently some stats about like users in Egypt, and it's, it's like skyrocketed. You know, I mean, everyone is like using Tor uh, uh, at the moment. Uh, there are also some Egyptian activists. Many of them, I mean, had to flee uh, abroad. Uh, no need to mention their names now, although they are like actually IT celebrities. And they have been playing also a wonderful role in terms of uh, exposing the phishing attacks that the regime is doing uh, and in providing manuals in Arabic uh, related to um, uh, cybersecurity. Um, I think... Uh, uh, there is, oh, sorry, there is one question, but gosh, it, it's going to take me a very long time to answer about social classes in Egypt and about, <laughs> and, and about the relationship between the ruler and urban. So if, if you don't mind, maybe I can find some resources and put it on the Facebook uh, event, because this is this, like a PhD thesis. <laughs> sorry. Yeah.
<laughs> but it's, it's a very valid question, though. <laughs> And hopefully you'll come to the bar with us afterwards. Oh, sure, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. The, we've got time for another round of questions and contributions. So, again, if you want to... Yeah, there's some on that. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. It's, it's very interesting. Um, I come from Spain, so maybe my questions are influenced by this perspective. Um, you, you mentioned this. Um, you showed also the map, and I found it very interesting because we could see it from a more geopolitical perspective maybe and not only from a more um, perspective more influenced by political ideologies and you talked about how important it is to have uh, an example in the in the region and um, in Spain there was um, a kind of yeah we can call it revolution that was also um, the, the performance of the revolution was very influenced by Tahrir and my question is if the things that happened in Europe arrive also um, uh, the news in, in the Maghreb. And uh, the other question is uh, also influenced by Spain. In Spain, uh, it was very criticized years later, but also during the revolution, that um, the revolution didn't have a concrete content and it was more about a protest. And uh, people said that this, this was going to be the end because it, it didn't have uh, any concrete aims. And my question is if you would say that this was also happening in Egypt and if as an answer people today, like in the years between the revolution, the start of the revolution and now are getting politicized and uh, you would say that the revolution is something more than the protest. Hi. Um, uh, I'm from Syria, and um, as you know, many Syrians, many Syrian activists specifically, um, end up in exile here in Berlin. And there's a certain scene, if you might say, of Syrian activists who ended up here in Berlin. And uh, what we, uh, what, what, what the question that always comes up is, what's, what, what could, have, what could be done basically from, from the exile? What sort of activism that could be initiated from, uh, from the exile, specifically when you're, uh, like while you are, your physical existence is, is not in the country, then what can you do from far away? Especially with lack of any actual real solidarity with the Syrian revolution, or specifically with all, um, in general, you know, with all revolutions in the Arab world, you have usually this anti-imperialist uh, nonsense to, to counteract it, or you have the, I don't know, Islamophobic uh, narratives, especially here among uh, people who are supposed to be our allies in, in Germany. So. How, um, how do you perceive uh, any potential for activism from the exile here in Berlin, for instance? First of all, thank you very much. That was both very informative and very inspiring. Um, can I ask you to talk a little bit about the balance between spontaneity uh, and leadership? You mentioned earlier uh, that you felt that there had been a lack of leadership and a difficulty in penetrating into the masses, for instance. Um, how do you see that evolving? And yet, do, it's obviously crucial, particularly in the centralization of the state apparatuses across the Middle East, all over. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is so inspiring, and there's so much in this. It's incredible. Okay. I think for us, any of us who are not Middle East, Sudan must be the most important focus at the moment. I was very inspired to hear what you're saying. Uh, some of us met yesterday as non-Middle East people, non-Sudanese people, to discuss what sort of solidarity we can have here. Um, we spoke to somebody on the phone who Sudanese normally lives in Berlin. She was talking not just about the poor strikes, but that the huge demonstrations all over the country are led by the unions. You have people marching, the unions, you have women's breaking, women breaking the law, saying they don't care anymore that Bashir has already lost. And this movement started with slogans saying that the, uh, the people want the fall of the regime, copying the Syrian slogan. Uh, these, the, these, this movement uh, developed further when Bashir from Sudan met Assad. And they were saying they were having no much. And at that time, of course, there were these demonstrations. So on BBC, there's a picture of the Sudan demonstrations and a banner slogan that big saying, bread riots. And the whole thing of black people, bread, riots. Um, and I think 
you know, what, what can we say about Sudan, the weapons, the tanks that are being used to shoot people on the streets, to kill the journalists, to target hospitals? They're paid for by the EU. They're paid for by Germany. And we are not doing anything about this. We also didn't have any solidarity on Syria, just to mention Syria. It's a small, uh, small group of activists here and there who've been doing things. There is secret service cooperation of the German government with Assad's secret services. Most people don't want to know this. We have a huge campaign, a letter campaign, against Germany sending Syrian people to the embassy, but they still do it. We, on this side, in this country, would need to be targeting this. Um, and to get back to Sudan, it's not just on the demonstration next Saturday, which we will hear about, but we would need to be building a much bigger network to target the German government, to target the EU, and to say, I mean, basically, what do EU governments say? They say Bashir shouldn't be killing demonstrators, and then they give them the weapons. It's like the new weapons to the mafia, and then saying, well, we'd like that you wouldn't shoot these people. And one question more on Sudan was very moving from the woman we were speaking to on the phone in Khartoum. Uh, two things I have to say because one is important. There was an attempt to divide that movement on a racist basis with the black people in the south. So all the demonstrators went out shouting, we are all from Darfur and the people in Khartoum. This is really quite incredible, this dynamic. Um, and uh, sorry, one last point was so important. Um, if you look at the history of that, then we, those of us talking about solidarity, talking about the, what the German government is doing, what the EU government is doing, we have failed on Egypt. We have failed on Syria. Obviously, we're failing on Israel, which actually gets taxpayer support for the weapons they use against the Palestinians. So it would be very, very important to build a movement around Sudan now and to try and get one example, which is what you're talking about, isn't it? One example which would then spread. So this kind of overlaps with the previous person's point. Uh, with Saudi Arabia, there is an increasing escalation of military um, weapons san sanctions. Is this a moment? And what would you like to see happen? I would like to ask two brief questions. Um, there was a lot of specific questions about each country, but I wanted to ask some general questions. Um, in terms of um, imperial reactions, um, do you think there was some sort of pattern in some cases? Or um, you think each case was totally different? Um, also, second one, um, the question of human rights violations. Do you think, because right now it's like a catastrophic lack of response from international community about human rights abuses in the Middle East and North Africa. And, um, do you think we are required to come up with more creative um, methods of holding accountability? Like, for example, the BDS movement in Palestine seems to be like one people that massive movement. Well, in any revolution, um, the, a really important aspect is um, how to deal with violence from the police and the military. So every revolution has to deal with this situation. Um, in Russia, they were obviously, in 1917, the most successful. Um, but most of the time, every time, except for that, I think, um, the military are, you know, the main enemy. They are the, the, the most fundamental difficulty of the movement is that you're going to have to come up against the mass oppressive force of the military, which is the, mo the most important arm of the state, fundamentally. And you're going to have to come up against that at some point and deal with that question. And um, it's interesting that in Egypt, it seems like... Um, from what I understand, it seems like people had a, like a friendly, relatively like a, a the the military was able to dress it, dress itself up as if it wasn't. Um, it came across as almost like a savior of the revolution. I'm I'm definitely ignorant on this, but it seems to me that um, they managed through the specific um, circumstances and development in um, in. Uh, Oh my god, I've forgotten the country. Egypt, sorry. <laughs> I'm nervous. <laughs> I went on a whole round about Egypt and I forgot the word. Um, yeah, um, so that, I just find that really interesting and I was hoping maybe you could talk about that a little bit more. That'd be awesome, thanks. This hasn't been said explicitly, but the migration policies that the EU is working out with all of these countries is really a big issue, and that must be something that people can do here. 
you said that the women's rights in Tunisia were better after the revolution. My question is what the, was the role of women during all those revolutions and um, did their situations get better? Okay, if there's no one saying this, Hassan's got time to answer, but he's got a lot of things to answer. And as I said, he'll send some things, post some things on the Facebook events, and we'll post them on the website. Just before Hassan sums up a couple of announcements, um, this has been organised by the Link of Berlin Internationals. We try and bring together um, non-Germans who are living in Berlin who to learn from each other's political experiences and to put pressure on the German government. Anyone who wants to get involved, please do. We meet on the fourth Monday of every month. Um, from this year, we're going to start meeting in the Rotterdam in Friedrichshain. The meeting, the coming meetings are on this slide, but the next one is a lie. It's not on the fight for women's liberation in Spain. It's for on the fight for women's liberation in Germany and Poland. We've got people from the Frauenstrike and Polish women uh, activists talking about what's happening there. On the 9th of February, we're supporting a meeting by Die Linke Charlottenburg about the coming European elections. We've got speakers from Spain, from France, from Britain and from Hungary talking about the situation in those countries. And here on the 19th of February, we have a meeting on the Aufstehen movement. We have people who are involved in the Aufstehen movement, people who are critical, and also people from France who want to talk about what's happening with the yellow vest and how that can be compared with what happened in Britain. That's all too much for anyone to take in. There's things on the leaflet, but if you sign up for the mailing list, we'll send you information there. Um, Hossam will sum up, and then we'll all go up to a, a, a pub. It's about five minutes. Everywhere around here is a little bit gentrified, so we've got to go a, 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 small, a small walk, but, but 500, 500 yards a kilometre up the road, and then we can carry on the discussion there. Okay. Um, uh, regarding the, the question from the Spanish comrades, um, listen, I mean, I, I do recall well in 2011 how those uh, pictures that we were seeing coming from abroad of the spread of the Occupy movement and the parallels they were striking with Tahrir and uh, strikes in Wisconsin uh, where like protesters raised, you know, I mean, this famous banner, American Tahrir. I mean, all of these things were definitely feeding positively our morale and, and encouraging us. Um, at the end of the day, and this is not some abstract theory, we do live under the same global capitalist system, and it's the same global system of oppression. Uh, you are lucky here in Germany that, you know, because of the accumulation of years and centuries of struggle, that you have managed to gain a bigger margin of freedom than the one we have in Egypt or in the Arab world. But at the same time, there is still so much that you can do here. And any, any victory for any dissident cause in Europe, I mean, of course, a cause that's like on the left, I'm not talking about the far right because they consider themselves, you know, I mean, leftists. Um, any, any sort of victory you achieve here in Europe, that's gonna feed into, uh, I mean, also the Arab Revolution. In the same way that if we manage to shake the system in, in our region, that will eventually, I mean, help you uh, here in Europe. Um, the domino effect is one of the golden uh, laws of any revolution, and, but it works both ways. It works with victories and it works also uh, uh, with defeats. Um, but at the same time, what happened in Spain, and I'm not the expert definitely on Spain, and I'm sure that, you know, uh, there are other people here in the room who were following the situation much more closely, but the impression that we got in Egypt that these Occupy movements focused more on square occupations other than workplace struggles. And I was just earlier trying to explain that it wasn't actually the Tahrir occupation that brought down Mubarak. It was the general strikes uh, that took place. Um, I'm not saying that occupying squares is a bad idea, but it should be part of your arsenal of strategy and tactics when you're trying to confront um, your government 
or whatever system that you're living under. But still, uh, labor strikes are definitely the, the much stronger um, um, uh, weapon. And by the way, any sort of achievement, even if you manage to get into some campaign about stopping gentrification in some neighborhoods, I do believe at the end of the day this feeds into the overall uh, global struggle. So do not underestimate any sort of activism that you do here in Germany. Uh, do not get this like romanticized image about like as long as I'm not carrying the red flag and the Kalashnikov, you know, then I'm not really doing much here. It, actually, like any, any sort of campaigns that you do here in order to uh, get reforms from the system in the hope of some radical change in the future, it does also, I mean, fall in, in our benefit. Um, activism in exile is a very tricky question, and uh, definitely um, the Syrian situation um, um, is also, I mean, different from other communities, since, I mean, at the moment, there is definitely a bigger influx of Syrians, let's say, compared to Egyptians. Um, so while, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm already here in Germany and I have some of my Egyptian, you know, I mean, comrades here and we're definitely trying to network. But I think actually in, in the case of um, the Syrian community, you have much more fertile ground to, uh, to organize. Now, to organize in what direction and what are the, what, what strategy and tactics, what goals that you want to achieve in exile, I think this will have to fall largely, I mean, to what you guys, you know, I mean, think are the priorities. But at least in the Egyptian case, I think that Egyptians uh, abroad, I mean, number one, we have to network, you know, I mean, th there are many Egyptians abroad who were, I mean, in favor of the revolution, were supporters of the revolution. And at least number one step is to network and know who's who and where is, you know, I mean, those people and get into some form of communication. Uh, secondly, is that to get into a serious discussion about what are our priorities. In the case of the Egyptian activist community here, we have decided that maybe the number one priority at the moment is to stop the influx of arms uh, into Egypt and stopping the security cooperation that the European security services are doing with the with the CC uh, with their you know I mean counterparts in, in in Egypt. This, for example, you know I mean our priority at the moment. Uh, second, it, it might be different in the case of the Syrians, and you have to think about it. Um, I would assume that in general, a common denominator between all Arab activists abroad is that we have to try to lobby into like getting foreign actors out of our region from all sides. I mean, and that would, you know, I mean, stretch all the way from the um, Russian and Iranian troops in Syria, actually all the way to Western troops. Uh, change has to be organic and indigenous. Once you start interventions from abroad under any pretext that you think is humanitarian, you end up with disastrous uh, conditions in the end. So definitely, you know, I mean, resisting foreign uh, interventions, uh, lobbying so that Europe and the other countries would open their doors for the influx also of refugees. Uh, I mean, in Germany here, I mean, as you probably know, and also, I mean, in the rest of Europe, uh, the issue of migration is, is being whipped up by the far right and by the fascists. And it is like the issue that everyone is like rallying, you know, I mean, around at the moment. And we do have a role in campaigning against this. This is fascism. You know, the, I, I have no other way you know, I mean, to describe it. And, you know, this is Germany. I mean, last time you had fascists here, it didn't really go that well. So, you know, I mean, people have to think about it a little bit before they vote for the AFD or whatever. Um, the issue of Saudi Arabia and sanctions, any, any sort of sanctions that will be imposed on this kingdom in order to curb its regional power, I'm definitely for it. I mean, there is no question. I mean, this is like, it's great. I do not think that the Americans will go all the way 
you know, I mean, till the end, it's not just about like Trump having some personal relationship, you know, I mean, with Ibn Salman. There is a strategic, you know, I mean, alliance between the American elite and the Saudi elite, and this has gone on for a very long time, and it's not going to go away anytime soon. I mean, yes, there could be tensions on occasions. Uh, I mean, the Americans were happy with, you know, I mean, they didn't mind the Saudis bombing Yemen back to the Stone Age, but, you know, killing Khashoggi, you know, I mean, inside the embassy was like too much for their stomach. But, you know, I mean, killing like one million Yemeni, that's, like, that's really fine. You know, I understand that there are dynamics, you know, I mean, behind it. But in general, I think our role as revolutionary leftists or as leftists is not necessarily to cheer American senators, but to keep on exposing the crimes of Saudi and to keep exposing the contradictions and the hypocrisy of the Americans in dealing with it and pressuring also to stop the, the, the flow of arms and stopping the Yemen war. I mean, definitely this should be on, on, on our agenda. Uh, the question about the imperialist intervention, uh, there, there wasn't uh, a systematic pattern. Actually, no, I mean, each case differed from the other. Uh, for example, in the case of Syria, I mean, you're all familiar with how, you know, I mean, the military interventions basically on the ground, you know, happened, whether it's by uh, Western and Eastern imperialist powers uh, having military presence on the ground or fighting via proxies. You have more than 30 foreign countries that are operating, uh, for example, in Syria. In the case of Libya, I mean, there were airstrikes by NATO and some ground troops that were supported by uh, mercenaries and ex-CIA agents, you know, I mean, at, at some point. Uh, in Egypt, from day one, Obama was very clear, according to, um, I mean, reports that came out, um, I mean, later, that the Americans should listen to what the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces are doing. They are not going to listen to those in Tahrir, and they are not going to listen, you know, I mean, to anyone else. They have to liaise with the Egyptian military into finding some smooth transition for Egypt that will continue to protect uh, uh, American interests. So, I mean, the Americans did not send in troops to uh, save Mubarak, but at the same time, they played a completely different game. So, no, I mean, the pattern hasn't been um, uh, the same. Um, the the inter, uh, uh, spontaneity and leadership. Revolution is not just a science, it's a science and art. It's both. I mean, one plus one, you know, could equal two. In a revolution, one plus one could equal five. You know, like it's, there is, there is an art into it. You have to always walk on a tight balance between spontaneity and pushing over with spontaneity and encouraging spontaneity versus organized actions. But there isn't a manual for it because every situation is different from the other. And your size as a player also makes a huge role. Like, you know, if you are a mass working class party that has like half a million uh, workers and roots in the workplaces and you are in control of unions, that your situation and your strategy and tactics would be different from a group of five Marxists who would think that if they just raise the right slogan, millions of people, you know, are just gonna suddenly flock to their side. It's different, you know, like, and by the way, we've been there at some point. I mean, the revolutionary social, I mean, we were like small study circles at some point in the beginning of the 1990s. Um, so, I mean, again, there isn't like um, a specific manual uh, regarding this. Um, the military in Egypt, that's definitely, um, what do you call it? that's like the pillar of the regime. Um, not only because the political establishment in Egypt and the presidents, they all come from the military, not just because the public sector, you know, major public sector companies and government facilities are all run by uh, military officers and the retired military officers who are given these uh, jobs as uh, a retirement uh, gift. Or, the, or part of the retirement package. Um, the military is like a state within a state. Um, and with the outbreak of the revolution, yes, they were taken by surprise. 
I mean, January 2013, uh, January 2011 is different from July 2013. January 2011, when the revolution broke out, they were taken by surprise. They descended uh, in order to control the situation after the police got, you know, completely defeated. But they were not sure that at that time, if they give the order to their soldiers to open fire, that their soldiers would obey. I mean, after all, Egypt is, uh, is an army based on conscription. It works differently than professional uh, soldiers. Now, but the same army, you know, I mean, did open fire uh, later uh, following the coup and was involved in terrible massacres. But note that the army at that time, they had enough time in advance to strategize and conspire and make their own moves so that they can carry out this coup. And most of the killings have been done by the special forces and by the elite uh, troops in that army. Uh, but again, I mean, armies are, are, not, are not a revolutionary entity. They are, were never revolutionary entity and they will never be a revolutionary entity. And this is something that um, in future um, uprisings or future revolutions, one has to put into consideration. Um, I'm following the, the discussion between Sudanese activists, you know, I mean, online, and some of the heavyweight, you know, I mean, organizers. And of course, the discussions they are having are way, way much mature than us in Egypt in 2011. Uh, not just because they are essentially rebelling against a military dictatorship, uh, but uh, they have also seen our mistakes. I mean, they, they have been learning from the Egyptian revolution. And, you know, I'm always conflicted whenever, like, I come across, like, you know, I mean, any article or any tweet about, like, oh, the Egyptians, you know, they screwed up in this. We shouldn't do that. I mean, partially, you know, I mean, I'm happy that, you know, the same mistake is not going to happen again. But, you know, we're being now used <laughs> as an example for anything wrong, you know, I mean, that went wrong. Um, the migration question, um, I mean, again, I've just, um, um, when I was addressing, you know, the question by the Syrian comrades, I mean, I think I touched on this point. Um, I mean, fighting illegal immigration is now like the new buzzword that the Arab counter-revolutionary regimes are using together with the war on terror. I mean, it used to be also the fight against terrorism. Now it's the fight against terrorism and the fight against illegal migration. And this is why, you know, I mean, Sisi is being hailed here in Germany as a hero. That's why he's being, like, you know, I mean, received in Austria as, like, you know, I mean, a true hero. And that's why, like, the far right in Europe, they do like Sisi. Uh, because he, he is largely involved in actually extrajudicial killings, I mean, of the smugglers, you know, I mean, in the, in the middle of uh, uh, the Mediterranean, um, uh, one of my colleagues here, uh, Kashif, he's uh, a migration expert and he's done extensive research. And I think if he can join us after the meeting, you can also have a chat with whoever is interested in that subject. He's definitely the man uh, to go to uh, regarding this information. Uh, but this is a myth. I mean, like, again, this is part of the discourse that revolutionaries, um, or leftists here in general in Germany has to fight against. And it is very, it's very traumatizing and it's very disappointing for me when I start finding people in the left here in Germany capitulating to that same discourse. Uh, and including even like people in Delinka, which you are very familiar with. Um, last question about women's role. Um, yes. Whenever, whenever there is a revolution and the revolution is going well, then you find that all, all causes uh, that are related to liberation are progressing. When a revolution gets defeated or it is retreating, all of these causes also, they get, I mean, defeated and retreated with it. Um, prior to 2011, uh, women in Egypt were, pray, were playing a central role in the strike wave. Uh, this is something that I've written about extensively, and I can share with you links on the Facebook event page, as I um, uh, said earlier. Uh, and with the start of the Egyptian revolution, I mean, women were playing a central role. But with the retreat of the revolution, 
I mean, one of the first targets were Christians, were Copts, sectarian attacks, and also sexual harassment, you know, I mean, attacks. There were horrible stories of sexual harassment in Egypt from 2013 onwards. I'm not trying to, de to say that, you know, sexual harassment didn't exist before 2013, but personally, I and so many others in the revolutionary circles, we could monitor that the situation was getting uh, uh, definitely uh, worse. So no group can liberate itself while the others are still in shackles. You know, so one cannot say that, oh, you know, I mean, the revolution got defeated in Egypt, but, you know, the women managed to get, like, you know, I mean, the rights. It, it doesn't work this way, you know. And even if temporarily the regime does secede some reforms to some group, I mean, all of this will be uh, uh, gone away completely uh, in the end. Um, I think I've answered the most, if not all, uh, the questions, and I would like to... Thank you again for uh, coming out to uh, this meeting. And, um, and, one, and finally, I just want to repeat that do not underestimate any sort of solidarity actions that you do here in Germany on behalf of the Arab revolutions or in fighting against the enemies of the Arab revolutions here in Germany. And that would include definitely the far right uh, and the others. Uh, thanks a lot. Okay, again, anyone who wants to carry on the discussion, um, we'll meet outside and go to the pub. A reminder again, Sudanese activists in Berlin are organising a demonstration on the 2nd this Saturday, and they're planning another one on the 9th. I don't have the information about when and where yet, but we'll post it as soon as we know exactly what's going to happen. It'd be great to have a good international block there.